I just want to talk to you a little bit about this book. Uh, this, this book is a very strange affair uh, because this book was uh, my, my first novel. Um, before writing fiction, uh, I uh, was foolish enough to start a theater company here in the Bay Area, which uh, was an experimental company. Uh, we did original developmental work, which means we got together at the beginning of a season we held auditions, uh, I selected a company, and then we began to do improvisatory exercises. And after a sort of a yeasty cooking spell that could last anywhere from 10 weeks to two years, uh, we, would, we would produce a piece for public consumption. But it was all based on this process of collective creation where everybody owned a piece of it, everybody helped to, to build it. So that's where I come from, and I have to say that it was a fabulous, a fabulous apprenticeship uh, for the writing of fiction. Uh, people ask me, well, you know, how do you become a writer? Well, the way I did it is I started a theater company, but not everybody has to do that. I think the best key is reading. Uh, that's the way you become a writer is you read. You go to school, to the masters, you, well, this is, of course, hierarchical talk. But you go to school to those writers that speak to you. Um, and eventually, you learn how to color words. You learn how to put a sentence together. You learn, you learn the music of language. And I will say this about music um, before I, I share some of this with you. In my company, the best performers, the most sensitive, the most creative performers, we're all trained in music in one way or another. So I think that music is the key to becoming a really good listener. So I'm going to start uh, tonight by uh, sharing with you uh, the opening uh, of this novel, which is called Face. It's published by Wings Press. Uh, for those of you who have a copy and want to follow, I'm on page six of the second edition. The second edition, by the way, uh, was, uh, was published in honor of the Newstat Prize. This novel has been uh, selected as a representative work. In other words, it's, it's all the work, but this is the representative one. So that's kind of why we're here tonight. Uh, so I'm going to start with the opening, and then I'll talk to you a tiny bit about, about this opening. In the sky, a cloud is forming. The head, the shoulders appear. It is May. There is a leaden gray outline lifting the white of the clouds in relief. The blue of the sky is cold, wintry. There is a greenish cast to the light. The sun is absent. A wind forms across the bay. The expanse of water marks its restlessness in the apparently static crests and troughs. From this distance, the waves appear not to move. Curls are rested on a tightly coiffed head. They do not move at all, looking, then looking away, then rapidly looking again. One can only seem to catch a movement more imperceptible than breath itself. Or perhaps the waves are the same, one trough closer to the shore, shifting slightly as if in a viewfinder. In the sky, the cloud has changed now. The head is lowered, or perhaps it has turned around, or the shoulders have risen to ward off a blow. No more. The giant is gone. Other shapes are forming. On the stair at the top is etched with a crack now. The concrete in the vein has crumbled. Little pebbles, aggregates of dust perhaps, have settled in the interstices. A child worrying the crack could dislodge them with a grubby finger. A child gazing out to sea, past the hook of land, letting his vacant eyes roam the shapes of giants left by the wind, by the clouds as they move. Vacant eyes puzzling the stillness of waves that move only when the gaze is averted. The man stands there not thinking of anything, 
fighting the stiff wind with each intake of air, the breath fought for, briefly denied, then won each time. Even with this wind, even at this height, the waves seemed to hold their very breath. Still moving, they barely move at all. This is the sky he can see every morning. <clears throat> this is the bay which on calm days seems barely to breathe from this height. The man stands to the left, a little behind the child, watching him idly. The child squats on the landing, worrying the crack. Perhaps some small dirt clod is wedged between his nail and finger cap. He studies it for a moment. The moment stretches, then snaps, as once again he bends to his examination. An insect, perhaps an ant, traces its path in the vein, now emerging from the crack, now disappearing. The man stands watching. A handkerchief covers his face. It is white cotton not linen. The corner which hangs below his chin flutters in the wind. The man stands there as if his hands are in his pockets. He does not move. This is the only pavement, this and the steps which stretch down the cliff face, switching back below, disappearing from sight long before reaching the water. So that's, that's the opening, and I just a word about openings. Uh, it's like a symphony, and this is the overture. And in my own process, every writer is somewhat different, but in my own process, uh, the overture is very, very important <coughs> because that is the thing more than any other that I know I've got something, I've got a tiger by the tail, okay? That's what it's about. Uh, I know that there's enough energy there to carry me through. And this was a four-year project. So there has to be a kind of sustainability, right? We talk about sustainability of the planet. But this is the sustainability of, of, uh, of the work that I do. Uh, this story is the story uh, of a man who has a catastrophic facial accident. Uh, in fact, those stairs are where he falls. And his face is completely destroyed. And as a result, he becomes a pariah, an outcast. Uh, he is essentially uh, disowned by his friends, his lover, his boss. He's unable to make a living. In other words, his whole social context disappears. It's lost. and. The story itself, for, on which this book is somewhat based, uh, has uh, a very interesting conclusion, because this man was denied any kind of help, uh, any kind of surgical uh, reconstruction. And he made a decision at a certain point in his life that he would rebuild his own face. And he performed 17 procedures in a Brazilian favela, in a slum, in the most primitive circumstances without a single instance of infection. And that's the story that I read in 1977 in the San Francisco Chronicle. It was a different paper in those days, a little more substantive. Um, but it was on the back page. It was Phil. You know, that's not news. This is Phil. Uh, they needed to make space. So uh, I thought, that's an extraordinary story. That's completely memorable. And some great writer will find this story and make a fantastic novel. And so, but I never lost track of where the clipping was in all of my disorder. My filing is a catastrophe. But I always knew where that clip was. I use my bulletin board, and I fasten it there. I pin it on so it can't migrate. So that was the first year. And then the second year, I waited for the great novelist to write the, this novel. And of course, the great novelist did not appear. And the third year, I waited, and the great novelist hadn't appeared. And I said, oh, shit. So I began to write. And the story I've just told you is the pretext, because this novel addresses all kinds of different issues. It's what we call very layered. It has all kinds of meanings. And what I really like about uh, 
about these readings that I do is that uh, whenever I share my work, uh, people have the most wonderful reactions because they comment about what this novel means to them. And it's all very different. Everybody sees something very unique that belongs to them. And it surprises me all the time uh, because these are issues that I don't even think about, that I, don't, I didn't know were there. Uh, and I like that very much because as a writer, my philosophy is that everybody shares in the writing process, the reader, as much as the writer. What if you gave a book and no readers came, right? The reader, the reader possesses this book too because when you read this, you bring the wisdom of your own life experience, not my life, but your life. You come to it with everything that you know, all of your cognitions, all of your experiences, all your loves, all your hates, and it belongs to you. So when I'm finished writing, this is yours now. Uh, and that's how I feel. I don't feel attached anymore to, to, to their eggs that I hatch. So I'm going to read to you now uh, from the middle section the door is closed now. On it the relics long dry of the undertaker's wreath. He stands poised on the raised threshold. He tries the doorknob. The door is fast. Someone has come up beside him, the neighbor woman. She stands by the door a little to the side of him. She called you when you didn't come, she shrugs. By way of apology, he takes off his hat Something clumsy in it. He realizes too late. The handkerchief falls away. He sees her hand fly to her mouth. She extends her hand without looking at him. He does not remember seeing the key ever before. The door, now padlocked, has always been open while she lived. She has not left very much behind to signal her passing. The iron cot is narrow, the husks burst through the mattress, ticking. At its foot, a wooden packing crate on which the words now faded, Carvalho, S.A., can be faintly seen, contains some bedclothes, a set of threadbare blankets. There is a wire-back hairpin chair whose provenance dates from a time before he can remember. On the warm, eaten floorboards is a faded rug of her making. The peripheral bands must have been added more recently. Their colors have not yet begun to fade. The dresser, however, is the piece he best remembers. It is nearly neck high. Of pale oak, its relief ornaments applied with cabinet maker's glue. Its condition in comparison with the other furnishing is still fairly new. There is a series of six drawers which take up most of the height. Surmounting these are two narrow compartments placed horizontally one next to the other, in all forming seven layers. On the surface, under the hurricane lamp, half filled with greenish oil, is a wash basin of white enamel rimmed in dark blue and a still white hand towel bordered with one narrow and one wide band of red scattered here and there. Traces of her sick room are still to be found, an old-fashioned hypodermic, the sterno burner and the ring, the dented pot, and on the dresser, beside the clutter of stale and dusty medicine bottles, a corroded spoon. In the end, someone had nursed her, given her needles to still the pain, the neighbor woman, perhaps. Perhaps it was she who watched to ensure her poor things were left undisturbed by thieves and strangers more poor than she to be carried out into the night. The room seemed larger then, perhaps because he saw it from the blanket she used to spread for him in the corner on the ground. He sits there now, his back propped against the wall, testing the truth of this. In the lazy afternoon, he watches as the dust particles catch the light until the room is alive with them, hundreds of them. The silence pulses, the stillness swells, 
with her presence until the room itself breathes as though the motes of dust floating might still be settling in the pregnant air the momentum of her last breath even now propelling them. Thank you. Thank you for your attention. So I thought what I would do is talk to you very briefly about the history of this novel because uh, curiously it's won all these prizes. Uh, I wrote this novel completely in a vacuum. I had no uh, friends who were writers. I had no idea that uh, this would become a novel. In fact, I was just writing something. And uh, I went up to Squaw Valley to, to attend uh, the community of writers one summer, and they had workshops. And I was encouraged by a woman who was conducting workshops there. And I, I met with her towards the end of the season, and I said to her, look, I have no guarantees that what I'm doing is going to see the light of day at all. Uh, but if it should happen, that it becomes uh, some kind of a something, uh, would you possibly give me letters of introduction to editors and agents? So indeed, uh, and when the time was ripe, she did so. And I went to New York with my heart in my mouth. And, and the manuscript, four copies, which I Xeroxed, uh, where I delivered them in plain brown envelopes to two editors and two agents. And um, within a week, Viking, uh, this is improbable. Within a week, Viking decided to buy this novel. This is unheard of. And I said, oh, no, 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 you can't have it. You can't have it. It's not finished. It's not finished. Uh, well, how much time do you need? Well, I, I, I'll, I'll, um, I'll bring it back on December 31st. And so I added material. Now that I know something about writing, we would call this resolution. How do you, you know, where's the, where's the denouement? How do you resolve this novel? But I didn't know those words, so I called it ending material. So it's ending material. And um, my agent uh, said to me, you know, this book is going to win many prizes. Many prizes? I, I just I couldn't imagine such a thing. My editor said to me, well, where did you come from? You know, she saw that I was a person of a certain age. Where did you come from? Uh, so I said, well, not the woodwork. I, uh, I had a life in the theater. I had a theater company for 12 years. Um, oh, she said, well, uh, who's going to blurb this? Where are your friends? I said, well, I, I really don't have any friends. I don't know other writers. But I knew that J.M. Coetzee, who's you know, a Nobel Prize winner now, I knew that he was a Viking writer. And I adored his work, particularly the early work. I'm not so fond of the later work. But to me, uh, Waiting for the Barbarians is the novel of the 20th century. And it's short. I like short. I write short, and I like people that can say it short. So um, I said, well, we could send it to J.M. Coetzee. So she did. Uh, but Coetzee was a very important, very busy man already. He was teaching linguistics in Cape Town in South Africa. And he had a whole pile of, of, of uh, packages from the post office that he hadn't opened. And uh, so faces went out. Uh, so anyway, um, it didn't get blurbed by Coetzee. The first edition has a blurb that says, speaks of interesting things in interesting ways. Now, wouldn't you just rush right out and buy a book that said that? <laughs> anyway, so that's the story of the blurb. Um, and my editor was very pleased that uh, she had bought this book uh, and that they had gotten it so cheap. And uh, so she took me to a watering place for lunch to celebrate the publication. And this is what she said to me. She said, you know, I think it's just wonderful that uh, writers are beginning to write about what they don't know. <laughs> so um, this novel has had a very interesting history because uh, by the time I wrote my third novel, 
Uh, my agent was going to put that up for auction, but nobody was interested except Little Brown. So Little Brown got it, uh, but Little Brown got it because they were paying three times more than what Viking was lowballing for. So Viking immediately took all of my Viking books out of print. See, I didn't know that would happen. A good agent would have told me that. Um, so this book, <laughs> and all those prizes, right? Um, this book has been out of print for approximately six or seven years, during which time it has been on so many college reading lists all over the country, and it was uneventful. So I went to Kinko's, and I gave them the master, and every time somebody was interested in assigning this novel, I would go to Kinko's, and I'd have X number of copies printed, and then I would take the cartons to the post office, and I would mail them, and I did that for six or seven years. <laughs> so I thought what I'd love to do tonight is just share briefly something to you about the American publishing industry. It's corporate, just like everything else. It's not about the writer. The writer is now a content provider and low man on the totem. And uh, there are no royalties to speak of. I was never told what my uh, statements were like, nor was I ever told how many books were published. So I'm going to share with you uh, some wonderful stuff here from the monthly review. This is the July-August issue. And I'm just going to share uh, uh, an article, just a couple of selections from this wonderful article, which is called 35 Theses on Advertising. Now, advertising, because it's part of the book biz, okay? It's part of popular culture. And this is by Paul Barron and Paul Sweezy. And there are, there are 35 theses, but I'm only going to read two of them. So bear with me. This is number 27. I think you'll like this. It is sometimes argued that advertising really does little harm because no one believes in it anymore anyway. We consider this view to be erroneous. The greatest damage done by advertising is precisely that it incessantly demonstrates the prostitution of men and women who lend their intellect, their voices, their artistic skills to purposes in which they themselves do not believe, and that it teaches the essential meaninglessness of all creations of the mind, words, images, and ideas. The real danger from advertising and publishing is that it helps to shatter and ultimately destroy our most precious non-material possessions, the confidence in the existence of meaningful purposes of human activity and the respect for the integrity of man. Now, ain't that a mouthful? Yes, let's all clap. It's pretty beautiful. Uh, yeah, I think I'm just going to leave it at that because the other thesis is, is, is less stunning than the one I've just read. So. Um, what I thought we should do now, because we have a little time left, I think, do we? Yes, we do. We have plenty of time left. So I would love to uh, engage you and uh, ask you if you would just uh, make comments or share questions, and we'll have a really nice discussion. So move on up for those of you who are back there so you can be part of this. And anybody who wants to ask a question or throw a brick back, please. Yes, Kurt. Yes, I apologize for this. It was called Theater of Man. I started in 1969 because I honestly believe that we all belong to the same tribe. But I have perhaps changed my ideas a little bit since then. Uh, but that's what it was called. And uh, for those of you who are interested, by the way, uh, my website is cecilepineda.com. And you can read all about my checkered past, can read about the theater. Uh, there's some, some pictures there of the work we did. I have to say that, you know, I had wonderful collaborators. This was not a one-woman show. No, no, no. I worked with anywhere from 15 to 19 actors, okay? And I tried to keep all of them happy. It's very hard to do with a lot of actors. They're very sensitive people, very touchy. Other questions? Yes, I do. May 1977, but I can't tell you the exact date. May 1977, and it was section one, the, the last page of section one. Of course, I don't remember the number. 
but 1977, yeah. So you've written nonfiction and fiction. Do you find, is there a difference? Is one <laughs> enjoyable for you than the other? Uh, well, it, it depends on the times. I feel that a writer needs to reflect the times. And uh, to answer your question in 25 words, the fiction writer must be a, a very imaginative liar because ultimately you're going for the deep truth, but you're not necessarily respecting the facts. So for example, the capital is Rio de Janeiro. We know it's Brasilia. And somebody, somebody at my last reading said, oh, well, he gets off the bus. He's walking with the sun behind him, so he's walking west, right? Now, he turns right. So what direction is he going? Huh? And you got it wrong, right? Well, what he didn't know is that in, in my imagination, it was a very long walk, and he went around the Sokolo, and then he made the right turn, okay, so he's going south. But that's all right because this man was very literate. So, okay, so that's the short answer. But a nonfiction writer, particularly a journalist, and, and the two books now, uh, Devil's Tango, and by the way, there are a couple of copies uh, there for sale as well. I brought Devil's Tango in for those of you who might like a copy. Um, a journalist needs to be absolutely truthful. And as you know, uh, this has become a very rare commodity now in journalism. So it's completely different. The challenge is completely different. Now, personally, uh, this is how I felt. Because our times are what they are, I felt that writing fiction has become, for me, a self-indulgence. I have no fiction bones left in my body. I don't. And so I've turned to nonfiction to address what I consider to be the greatest challenges of our time. And the greatest one, in my view, uh, is nuclear energy and uh, nuclear weapons, because that is where uh, Armageddon is writ large in the history of humankind. All right, other question. Have you been to the Rio Say again. Have you been to the Rio Swan? Yes, I have. I have. Yes, I've traveled quite a lot in the third world. Yes, I have. And I have stayed in uh, what I suppose in this country people would call a flop house. So I know what that's like. And uh, North Africa, India, Thailand, and Indonesia, those countries. Yeah. And here? Say again? And here in the United States? Ah, oh, well. I was born in Harlem. I imagine. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. That, yeah. And I have to tell you, you know, uh, you're born in a place and your mother wheels you around in a baby carriage. You never forget it. Ever. Ever. Because that color is in your eyes. Very deep. Well, I think we're going to end it there. Well.